floor yours. Okay, thank you so much. And uh, of course, uh, I like to 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 start my talk by thanking uh, 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 Choi, uh, uh, Professor Choi, uh, Professor Filatov, uh, and of course, uh, Dr. Lee and uh, uh, Dr. Sue uh, Jerry, uh, uh, as I learned today, uh, for for the in this invitation to to talk about uh, some of the work that has been done done by my groups. Uh, actually, what I wanted to talk about is an attempt to get the biologists uh, which uh, are interested in uh, photochemistry, you know, more specifically photoresponsive proteins, uh, in using uh, electronic structure methods in their uh, everyday research. However, uh, one issue when you talk to these people that you immediately find uh, out is uh, that uh, these people are not really interested as in a single molecule. So they are not really interested in a single protein. They're actually interested in uh, full families of uh, proteins. Uh, what they wanted to do, they wanted to learn how within a, a specific family of uh, photoreceptors, for instance, the protein sequence is actually affecting the spectroscopic properties of the protein itself. And um, I'm going to make you an, an example of a, of a situation like that. And this is uh, related to the so-called rhodopsin superfamily. Uh, rhodopsin are proteins made basically by a, a protein part, which has a cavity. And inside of the cavity, uh, there is a chromophore, a molecule which is able to catch a light. And uh, this chromophore is always the same. So it's not the changing within the family. What the only thing that is really changing is the protein sequence. So basically the amino acid composition of the protein. In spite of that, uh, as you can see uh, at the left of this slide, you can get so many different colors. So basically the idea is that the, the protein sequence can actually change the properties of the chromophore, and, uh, which seems very natural to uh, a theoretical chemist, but definitely for a biologist is a fascinating problem. And it is actually a difficult problem because they want to learn how precisely the protein sequence is controlling the spectroscopic property like absorption, but also emission of, uh, of, the, of the chromophore inside it. And uh, they try to do that experimentally, okay, which means uh, through mutation, through mutagenesis experiment, they wanted to change the sequence in the laboratory to see what is happening and to learn, after all, how, you know, how to engineer new proteins, which may be, uh, for instance, absorbing very much to the red. And there is a very uh, important reason for this uh, uh, effort which is also an expensive effort. And it is uh, that this particular uh, family of protein, the rhodopsin, nowadays are becoming uh, important tools for investigating uh, the uh, working of uh, uh, a, a neural network, not a mathematical neural network, but really biological neural network. So basically the brain. So what, has, what, what, what this uh, uh, rhodopsin do, they can actually if you shine light on it, on them and, and if they are expressed at the neuron level, they can actually trigger um, a nervous signal. They can actually silence again a nervous signal or even they can visualize the traveling of a nervous si signal as you will see later uh, along a, a, a neural network itself. So, so that's it's very important. They are making a huge effort, but they will not possibly achieve what they want because of the difficulty of this experiment and because they have to express and characterize experimentally in the laboratory hundreds, if not thousands of proteins to achieve that. So it's natural for us to think that perhaps, uh, you know, electronic structure theory uh, within QMMM uh, models of this protein can actually help in this case, okay? So that's the idea. Uh, but of course, uh, as uh, you all know, to build up uh, uh, manually a QMMM model is already difficult enough. I let you to uh, judge yourself how difficult would be 
to build manually uh, hundreds, if not a thousand of QMMM models for an entire family of proteins. So, so that is impossible. And that is why several years ago, uh, uh, I had uh, this uh, uh, idea that we may write a program, a code that is building automatically a QMMM model for you. And in this way, uh, uh, we can perhaps uh, enter in a better way, in a more effective way, the field of uh, molecular biology, for instance. Of course, uh, if you want to do something like that, you have to think about which kind of uh, QMMM model you are going to build automatically. Uh, and this cannot be one of the most accurate uh, uh, QMMM model you, you, you may have heard of. Uh, that is extremely complex. There are several variables, several decisions to be taken, uh, long molecular dynamics for the equilibration. So we need really to uh, look for models which are simplified, but hopefully can be uh, uh, still accurate enough to give uh, at least the trends uh, of the change in, uh, in, in the property you are interested in, mainly excitation energy, for instance, along a certain family. And this is uh, the model we came up uh, with uh, over the years, and this has been uh, developed with uh, Nicolas Perret, which is working in the same uh, uh, institution of Mario, by the way. And uh, it's a, a pretty simple model. It's a gas phase model uh, of, uh, of uh, this uh, type of uh, light responsive proteins. Uh, of course, the uh, QM part has to be sophisticated enough for treating uh, uh, spectroscopy. We are using CASPT2 and most recently XMS CASPT2, also thanks uh, to uh, Roland Lind, which is the speaker. This is coming after me and, uh, uh, you know, is a support over the years. Uh, and, you know, other thing, simple things like an electrostatic embedding and also we are only uh, allowing to relax the, in the, really the cavity uh, which hosts the retinal chromophore, which is, by the way, our QM part. So, so this is a pretty simplified uh, uh, type of, uh, of the model, and we just uh, uh, tried to uh, write a program to build it automatically. And I must say that we succeeded uh, thanks uh, over the years and thanks uh, to the hard work or, of many people like Malacho, uh, Valentini, most recently Pedraza Gonzalez, De Vico and Padula. And this is I'm going to, what I'm going to show to you a little bit now, uh, how the, the, the code is, uh, which is written in Python, is, is designed that is uh, uh, basically is working in three phases. The first phase is preparing the input. And uh, this means that is uh, uh, automatically selecting uh, things like uh, the cavity, which uh, amino acid belongs to, to the cavity, uh, assigns the protonation state, uh, and also makes uh, the entire model uh, neutrally neutral uh, by assigning counter ions uh, to, to the uh, charged amino acids. Uh, one thing that you immediately notice that uh, this is actually a kind of a program that is actually more a protocol than a program because it's interfacing uh, other very well-known type of uh, software which is freely available uh, with the, with the general purpose to, to get the, the function, basically, uh, uh, like a, a pocket is selecting a pocket in a protein, uh, model is selecting the, the right conformation of, uh, of side chains, so Propka is assigning the uh, uh, ionization states of group and so on and so forth. So the second phase is uh, the building of the, of the QMMM model itself. And uh, as you can see here, uh, uh, you, have, uh, you have the assignment of water molecules, for instance, inside the, of the hydrogen, of course, because usually this model starts with uh, X-ray crystallographic structure, uh, some relaxation with molecular dynamics, uh, and of course, uh, the quantum chemical calculation and geometry optimization only at the CASA-CF level. Of course, it's impossible to do at the moment optimization of the CASPT2 or XMS uh, CASPT2, uh, at least uh, in a reasonable 
time scale. Uh, and you end up with your model, which is basically uh, the uh, ground state equilibrated model of the protein. Most recently, we have uh, also implemented uh, a, a further phase in the, in the protocol that will instead generate equilibrium structure in the excited state of this particular protein, okay? So, so we, we can do both absorption, but we can also do fluorescence because uh, uh, our code is uh, uh, really, uh, I mean, uh, working on uh, uh, both the excited state and, and ground state, thanks, uh, of course, uh, to the particular electronic structure uh, method level that we are using. Notice that you can construct the ground state model in a 24 hours uh, wall clock time on a, on a standard cluster uh, uh, processor here. So, so you get a model in, in 24 hours completely automatically without human intervention uh, and uh, uh, starting substantially only from uh, the X-ray crystallographic structure, if you have one, or an homology model in the absence of uh, uh, an X-ray crystallographic structure. So as uh, far as the performances are concerned, of course, you would expect that uh, this uh, type of simplified, uh, let's say, QMMM models uh, are not uh, uh, totally robust, but uh, uh, as you keep, can see here from the absorption data, excitation energy calculations, to be more correct, vertical excitation energy, uh, the uh, absorption, the measured absorption of uh, uh, 26 different rhodopsin coming from 18 different organisms, which, as I was telling you, they absorb at different wavelengths, is, uh, is pretty much reproduced from the trend point of view. So that's uh, uh, biologists are actually interested more in trends than not absolute value. So, so that is true for, uh, of course, uh, uh, a structure, input structure that is coming from X-ray crystallographic structure, also from comparative uh, uh, structure, uh, comparative modeling or homology modeling. And also, if you wanted to try to use these tools to do engineering, protein engineering, exactly how the biologists want, there is also a module to perform mutations in this protein. So really mutate them. And you also have the possibility here, because uh, uh, lambda max, the, the absorption maximum of mutants has been measured, to compare your prediction with the, uh, let's say, with the with the observation and uh, at least in this case of bovine rhodopsin and uh, uh, a, a microbial rhodopsin seems to, to work pretty well. But however, you will see here big discrepancy between automatically predicted models and the observation. And yes, sometimes uh, we fail. Uh, let's say that uh, the, the robustness as, as far as our testing has been uh, carried out uh, until now is 80%. 80% uh, uh, of the cases uh, we, we get uh, uh, excitation energy with uh, reproduce the trend, the change in, in other cases not. Of course, we went to look for those outliers, uh, outliers and uh, we realized that basically in all cases we examined, the problem is uh, about the, the assignment of uh, the ionization states of groups. So sometimes, uh, Propka, that is the software that we are using to assign uh, uh, ionization state, is not uh, predicting the right uh, um, charges. Uh, and sometimes also uh, the programs that uh, are meant to predict the rotamer in mutants, for instance, uh, uh, is not really doing a good job. Those uh, are things that need to be taken care of in future um, work on, on, this, on this protocol. Now let me uh, go to the, let's say, to discuss with you the last part of my talk, which is about uh, the possibility to also uh, look at the fluorescence of these proteins, which is extremely important because with the fluorescent rhodopsin, you can really visualize, as uh, in this movie here, you can really visualize how a nerve impulse can actually travel along the axons of a neuron. So this is fascinating. But of course, uh, the 
fluorescent rhodopsin, which are available to the biologists right now, are extremely, you know, weak in their fluorescence. Uh, you know, what I mean is that the fluorescent quantum yield is extremely weak. So they wanted to engineer a rhodopsin in such a way to increase the fluorescent quantum yield. So we took this type of challenge, uh, and this is work uh, mainly of a student, Leonardo Barneski, where we took uh, seven different, uh, uh, what uh, we call fluorescent rhodopsin, actually they are just weekly fluorescents. Two of them are natural, five are actually engineered by the biologist and see if we can actually, uh, let's say, reproduce the experimental observation with the, our automatically generated model. Those models are totally automatic, not modified manually after their construction. And uh, to start with, you see that we do pretty well in computing the absorption maxima, which is, as you see, can see, is a range of absorption maxima from the blue to the green here, to the red here, basically. But this is not the most interesting part because this is the absorption. What is really interesting is the, is the fluorescence. So, so here we are predicting the fluorescence, uh, which is coming in a much more narrow from the same protein, narrow, um, let's say, range with respect uh, to the absorption. Uh, and uh, yes, we, we, we actually reproduce this narrower uh, range of fluorescence uh, for, for these proteins, but then of course, the most important part would be to, pre to, to predict the, the fluorescence intensity. So at the moment, we do not have in our uh, code a way of uh, uh, predicting the fluorescence quantum yield, but we may, can make an hypothesis, for instance, that the fluorescence quantum yield is proportional to the excited state lifetime, and that the excited state lifetime is obviously uh, depending on a barrier, which is restraining the molecule from relaxing along the excited state potential energy surface. And this is what we did. We evaluated uh, uh, the barrier here uh, along the, potential, the excited state potential energy surface using our model. And as you can see, we, we, we find a nice uh, match with the, the, uh, the fluorescence quantum yield. Namely, we find, uh, uh, let's say, an exponential the relationship between the, ba the barrier height and the fluorescence quantum yield. And uh, seems, this uh, seems to be uh, uh, quite a, sen you know, a sensible answer uh, in favor of the quality and perhaps on the usefulness of, of, of our models uh, uh, as of course uh, the barrier is, uh, you know, is in an exponential with the, with respect to the kinetic constant, and therefore with respect to the excited state lifetime. Uh, okay, so I think uh, I, I'm done. Except that uh, I wanted to talk uh, uh, a little bit uh, about the future, uh, and I'm very happy that the previous section Mario Mario was here because because he knows that we also do. Uh, uh, Tally Alpha's hope uh, trajectory calculation, you know, mixed quantum classic uh, trajectories uh, in order to, to, to compute the quantum yields, uh, this time reaction quantum yields, photoisomerization quantum yields. Because, you know, one of the job of these uh, proteins, rhodopsin, is actually that of uh, uh, isomerizing the retinal in response to the, to the light absorption, which is not much useful for the uh, uh, technological applications that we have seen before, but it is actually uh, the trigger for the biological functions of rhodopsin, like vision. You know, our own, uh, let's say, uh, photoreceptor in the eye is one of these rhodopsins. So one dream, it would be obviously to be able to automatically compute uh, uh, photoisomerization quantum yield. And this uh, is possible in principle if you automatically generate uh, uh, the initial condition. So, so many uh, you know, snapshots that can be then uh, projected on the excited state, like you know, simulating a Boltzmann distribution, for instance, projected on the excited state and uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, um, propagated uh, using uh, 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 mixed quantum classical 
trajectories that we wanted to do for maybe tens, not hundreds of, of, different, uh, of different proteins to, to learn about the, the, the evolution, the biology of, of, of these uh, systems. Now, uh, uh, this is just uh, an example. Sorry about that. This is just an example of preliminary data that we got. And uh, as you can see here, we have been able to compute the, with this type of models, not other type of model, but this, with this type of model, which have been automatically constructed, the um, uh, basically uh, uh, excited state photoisomerization dynamics uh, of both a, a modern mammal and, and, and also a dinosaur, because, because in principle, you can also construct the, the protein of an extinct, uh, an, an extinct species, uh, since the biologist can provide the, the sequence. Uh, that's uh, that's uh, the end uh, of, of, of my talk. Uh, just to summarize, uh, we, we basically are, are very much uh, interested in developing uh, methods for automatically generated QMMM models, both in the ground and in, in the excited state, uh, with the target of uh, helping uh, uh, biologists and even evolutionary biologists uh, in their characterization of uh, photoresponsive proteins. So, um, thank you very much for your attention. I just wanted to talk about, uh, introduce the people that did, uh, that did the work. Uh, this is the group uh, in Siena, in uh, the University of Siena, and uh, Luca De Vico, Maria del Carmen, uh, Marine, uh, I don't know, Luca De Vico and uh, Laura Pedraza Gonzalez are uh, one of the developers of this code. Uh, Leonardo, I already mentioned it, is studying uh, the fluorescent uh, rhodopsin and uh, together also with uh, Emanuele Marsiri, which is now doing uh, um, uh, his PhD studies in the UK. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Massimo. <laughs> so, session is open for questions. Okay. Uh, Michael wants to give a question. Right. right. Uh, yeah. I, thank you, Massimo, for a very interesting talk. Okay. Um, may I ask you about your uh, last slide yeah. about dinosaur and uh, yes. cattle? <laughs> yeah. Right. Does this mean that dinosaurs had a lower quantum yield of isomerization? Uh, yes. Yes, exactly. So their vision was less efficient. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I mean, I wouldn't really advertise it uh, so so much because, uh, because number one, this, this stuff uh, is not uh, published yet. We, we are writing up a paper just right now. But, you know, you have to be very, very careful. In principle, we should uh, really do this type of study for, for an entire set of, uh, of, of rhodopsin, of maybe, let's say, how, how they call it technically in the biologic, in the biologists call it resuscitated proteins, basically. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but uh, the problem is that there is no, the real problem is that there is no measurement. I mean, there is a measurement of the, of the lambda max. So, so we know that we are reproducing the change in absorption maxima of, uh, of you know, the dinosaur with respect to the cow uh, rhodopsin. But, but, but the, the, the quantum yield, the photoisomerization quantum yield has not been measured for, for the dinosaur because, because the sample is, is too little. They could uh, reconstruct the protein in the laboratory, but the sample is too little. So right, we yeah. are waiting for, you know, right. better That would data. be indeed very interesting to know how did they see in reality, if you yeah. can model these extinct species. That that would be exactly. really very fascinating topic. Yeah, that's uh, that's what one one of the main uh, direction uh, of, of our research right now. Right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Uh, if you want to give a question, please let me know. Uh, I don't see. Oh, maybe I would I would like to have a questions to you. And uh, um, 
Uh, you mostly uh, use uh, multi reference. I think that may be the, the best way. Uh, mm -hmm. Have you considered something other than the uh, CASPT2 levels? Yes. So, so this is, thank you very much, uh, Choi, uh, um, for this uh, question, because actually I prepared a, a small comment on this uh, and also, uh, you know, a, a request because obviously, obviously uh, we use the cas -SCF and cas -PT2 because we have been using that for years for studying photochemical reactions. So, so we know how to, um, you know, handle the, the problems uh, that may uh, occur when you, you know, compute excited states. But of course, those are expensive techniques. And the, and the bottleneck in the, in the construction of uh, uh, the QMMM models automatically is exactly the cost of the gradient calculation at the CASPT2 level, not to, to mention, well, not at the CASPT2, but at the CASCF level, not to, to mention if you wanna go, you know, beyond that, so like uh, XMS CASPT2, uh, then, then the gradient either is not available or is extremely expensive. So, so we are really look, looking for, for like uh, other methodology that may be uh, responding well in uh, uh, treating this type of, uh, of molecules. I mean, as you can see, we need uh, not only to reproduce uh, the spectroscopy like absorption of fluorescence, we really want also to methods that are robust enough to deal with the photoisomerization and therefore to deal with the decay at the conical intersection in a correct way. So, so that uh, is something that we know we can handle with the CASSCF, but you know, uh, we, we, we wish to, to go beyond, you know, to find other methods. We, we actually been uh, screening methods uh, recently, as probably many of you <laughs> know, we, we, we published several papers on benchmarking different uh, electronic structure theory. Surely, uh, like methods like uh, your methods, for instance, and uh, uh, Michael methods, uh, Michael Filato methods in, in the FT, they are really something that I, I really would like to try in this context. Obviously, an effort has to be, to be made in integrating those QM method in our uh, software, in our, in our, in our basically uh, programs. And, and that's, that's the problem, I think. Okay, thank you very much. <clears throat> so, uh, Emmanuel? Yes, so thank you very much, Massimo. Very nice oh, talk, hi. really, really hi. interesting. Hi, nice Henry. to see you. <laughs> I have a question. When you started your talk, you said I have to do lots of work and to develop a specific model mm -hmm. for a specific mm -hmm. molecule. And then I thought you would tell us about machine learning. And uh, this did yeah, not yeah, happen. Right. So, <laughs> so I've, I mean, it's, it's maybe an obvious question, but uh, could that be useful in this case? Or yeah, I, I, be, I believe uh, I believe it, it could be well useful. Uh, and we have done a little work on that but uh, not uh, on, uh, on the side of solving uh, the problem with the computational cost, uh, more on the side of predicting uh, mutants, okay. rather than doing a lot of modeling, and then uh, to, to see where the modeling is driving us uh, to uh, using uh, QMMM, you can do uh, maybe a little bit uh, of less modeling, so a, a less than a, a, a reduce the number of models and then uh, use uh, those data to to fit a model for the machine yeah. learning and use machine learning to predict the next uh, sequence that could be more and that's of course ma machine learning is so cheap you can do that we we tried to do that but we failed <laughs> in this in the sense that uh, we had the, we discovered we had the too few models and uh, uh, they were not accurate enough to 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 predict. But we we I cannot tell you the reason. We are still in the investigating that. If it is that the model that we choose for fitting was not good enough, or uh, the data, the original data that we could get, uh, were not uh, were not precise enough. But okay. Yes, so he, he, the, those techniques of machine learning uh, uh, 
I'm sure they, they would play a role in this field as well. I, I'm sure it's just a matter of uh, efforts and, and time. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very time. much. Thank you. Uh, although we are 